shared in first service something that you can't know unless someone tells you, unless you just have met Keith and you know him. I asked him in first service, uh, I have to ask him again, was it 46 that you were 46 years old when you married Joy? 46 years old when he married Joy, had an instant family of four children. Uh, Michelle was uh, a senior, so she wasn't in the house long. Uh, and then it wasn't too long after that they moved to Colorado, and that was at the time that Rusty, the oldest son, took his life uh, here on the uh, river there in Washington. And so they, of course, came back uh, for that situation and event. And uh, that was where your present pastor met your present youth director on the uh, floor of the living room. He tells the story quite a bit, uh, just down uh, Bethel Church Road here uh, in a little white house where his mother lived, I'm sorry, grandmother, uh, and of course his mother lived there too uh, when she was little, but uh, he was playing baseball cards, uh, and because, you know, 12-year-old kid not knowing really how to handle what is going on, uh, Rusty was his hero in life, and uh, I had never met Brad Banderman, uh, John Smith uh, told me all about that he knew about Joy and the such, a solid lady, and, and just loved her dearly, and he said, you'll, you'll love Joy when you when you meet her and you understand her and you, you grow to know her. And uh, sit down there with Brad, uh, you understand at that time, uh, Arkansas, well still to this day, Arkansas does not have a professional team, period. So I didn't really understand the whole professional ball team uh, draw, and, but uh, Brad had all these St. Louis Cardinal uh, ball cards and had many others, had a very nice uh, collection at one time. And so I just sat down there and just did my best to act like I knew what I was doing, uh, and I didn't. But I did know that this young man needed some support. That was the start of a lifelong friendship, and, and, and you know what all happens here uh, as a result of Brad's ministry and how you praise the Lamb. But there was a constant in Brad's life that will never be touted, except if Brad or I and others tout it, and that is Keith Ragsdale. And Keith has been a consistent man to Brad and his family. And then you know recently they've already gone through another loss of suicide with Amy. And did you hear the song? Looking unto Jesus and him alone. It's how, it's how you do it. It's how you get through. Remember I told my sister-in-law, you need to write a book. And my sister-in-law said, there's no happy ending. And I said, Vicki, a happy ending is you got up this morning. A happy ending is you're taking care of your two handicapped children without your husband. The, the, the happy ending is, is you're still faithfully taking them to church. You're serving the Lord uh, with, quote, unquote, all of these difficulties. The happy ending is you're making it through. And how many people in this planet have those same struggles, and they don't know how they're going to make it till tomorrow? Jesus, looking unto Jesus. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 30, 1 through 8. We're going to read it here in just a moment. But, you know, all sermons have to have an introduction. <laughs> so, uh oh, yeah, this is a man's tool. Uh, years ago, I was walking through Dickie Bub, and there in their pipe wrench aisle, I saw this monster of a wrench. I've never seen anything like this before. You understand I'm not in the construction world. I'm not, you know, you don't want me working on your house and all those neat things. But I like tools. And the more things I try to get into, the more I like tools. And I saw this tool and I thought, why? Why do you need? I mean, I'm not much of a man. And it's taken all I got to hold this up. My right hand is shaking type thing. This is heavy, all right? Now, so what on earth could you, you know, you're not going to one-hand this unless you're Marvin uh, uh, Kimsey. <laughs> Daryl's already told the story of him one-handing one of these uh, and the such. But if you saw Marvin last week, he's a, he's a real man, you know. He's, a, he's all man. And so here's the point. If you talk to people in the construction world, and we have several uh, in our church, there are ap actually applications for this tool. 
And when you need a tool like this, no other tool will do. And so I bought this thing, how many years ago? It looked a lot better when I bought it. <laughs> you got to know me to understand that. And so I came up with the phrase after that tool and that Father's Day sermon many years ago now, the right tool for the right job. This tool, and I have used this tool at my house on a time or two. I already told the Marvin story that you shared. You did? Yeah, because oh. oh. I said there's no man that's going to one-hand this except Marvin. Yeah. yeah, and men like Marvin. What is manhood? Manhood is the right tool for the right job. What's the job? Well, did you watch Fox News recently? Did you watch CNN recently? Did you watch, I mean, fill in the blank recently? Do you, are you aware of what's going on in our nation? Are you aware of where our nation's at? That's the job. Have you read the Great Commission recently? Have you seen, I mean, every uh, month it seems like somebody takes great joy in talking about how so few people in America believe in God anymore. That's the job. Manhood and womanhood, according to the Word of God, is the job, and I'm sorry, is the right tool for the job that we have in the United States of America. As you and I submit to manhood and womanhood, according to God's word, we're going to see God fix a lot of things. I believe that with all my heart. We see this applied here in 1 Samuel 30. Let's all stand for the reading and reverence of God's holy word. And I am going to look here very quickly. I had it open in first service, and of course I shut it, but you can find it pretty easily. All right. And it came to pass... 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and, and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Can you imagine? David, much less the 400 marauders that he has with him, they've done whatever it is that they were doing, most likely setting a city free, most likely doing some sort of justice in God's name, and they come back, and the entire city that their families have been living in is burning. And then when they search the city, they find that there's no dead humans. So they've all been taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept. So, so much for real men don't cry. No one would ever accuse any one of these men in this group of 400 of not being a real man until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people's sake, for the people spake of stoning him. So you need to get this scene. They ride upon the burning city, and all of their people are gone. They cry to the point of exhaustion, and now... You know, somebody has got to pay. And so they start talking of stoning their leader. Because, you know, if it wasn't for the leader, they would have been here. They spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. Here it is. But David encouraged himself in the Lord, his God. And David said to Abathar, the priest, Amalek's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Father, we ask you to add your blessings to the reading and preaching of your holy word. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. You may be seated. Can you think of a heavier burden? Your wife's, your daughters and sons are gone. That's heavy enough, isn't it? Now 400 men that you lead, all of their wives and children are gone. That's on you. 
and now they want to kill you. That's on you. Pretty big job. Manhood was the right tool for that job. Instead of sitting there and arguing with them and begging them, please don't kill me, please don't throw those rocks, please, men, you got to trust me when I tell you I don't understand this either. Instead of all that, sir, bring the ephod. But before he did that, the Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord. I'm convinced, men, women, boys, and girls, there is no more important ability as a Christian than to be able when every the chips are down and the world, your world is falling in on you, maybe the world, there's no greater ability than to get along with God and know that you can come into his presence and you can get what you need from him. And David had that confidence. And so David got along with God and said, Lord, you know where I'm at. I'm devastated. You know what these men are thinking. I'm devastated. I need something, Father. I need something. And the Holy Spirit was very clear. Come and ask me. So he says, give me the ephod. What in the world was the ephod? I want you to listen to J. Vernon McGee, a great, if you, if you are looking for a good set of commentary, they're not very expensive and there's not very many books. There's five books on the whole Bible. So, yeah, it's a little shallow. But it's good. Listen to what he says about the ephod. i got to make sure I'm on the right spot here. The ephod was a portion of the high priest's garments which spake of prayer. This garment went over the garment that the regular priest wore. The ephod set the high priest apart. It was the garment he wore when he went into the golden altar of prayer. It had two stones, one on each shoulder, on which were engraved the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Six on one shoulder, six on the other. In other words, the high priest came to the altar of prayer bearing Israel on his shoulders. This is a picture of Christ, our great high priest, who carries us on his shoulders. It's exactly the right tool for the right job. He put on. He owned it. This is on me, Lord. And ultimately, it's on you. And I'm coming and asking you, what do you want me to do? And God says, go get them. <laughs> go get them. You're going to recover every one of them. I'm going to give you victory. And so now all these men are, are thinking, okay, you know, got to work out the bursitis. They're getting ready. And David gets on his horse. And he turns his horse toward the direction that God told him. And they're like, whoa, 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 hey, we're trying to kill you. Uh, come back here. And he turns and says, gentlemen, I'm going to get my family. Who's up for that? So now you got a choice to follow the guy that you've been following for years now, has proven himself as a real man, and throw the rock down, they get on their horses, and they go get their wives and children. It was the right tool for the right job. Jack Brewer, who is a former NFL uh, player, and he is, uh, everything I can tell, he's a Christian, a strong Christian, and he was on Fox News, and he said this this week. There is little doubt that America is experiencing an unprecedented fatherless crisis. Approximately 80% of single-parent homes are led by single mothers, therefore leading to nearly 25% of our youth growing up without a father in the home. This staggering statistic has not only destroyed the nuclear family, but has devastated communities across the nation. For example, 85% of children and teens with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes, and over 70% of all adolescent patients in drug and alcohol treatment centers originate from homes without fathers. Research indicates that children without fathers at home are nine times more likely to drop out of school and represent 90% of all homeless and runaway children. We can no longer afford to ignore the debilitating impact that fatherless homes have on our youth and our country. As Americans across the country prepare to give thanks to the millions of hardworking fathers, and we should, let us not leave behind the forgotten men, women, and children who do not celebrate alongside us. So none of these statistics are meant to put on shame. None of them are meant to, to degrade anyone. It is to put the light on it to see what a great need is in our country. The success of our nation depends on four central tenets, faith, family, free market, 
and education. This is Jack Brewer's words. And our resolution is the first of many measures that champion the spirit of these four tenets with the support in which they deserve. And he's referring to uh, a resolution that he is trying to get passed through our Senate on the U.S. level and our uh, House to support fatherhood. Lastly, to the God-fearing fathers, these are still his words, throughout our nation, we ask that you look beyond your own homes and make intentional efforts to coach, mentor, and support the fatherless children in your own communities. That at the very least, we owe that at the very least, we owe to ourselves, our children, and our fellow fellow countrymen. Now he's not telling you to neglect your own to help others. He's not telling you that. He's telling once you've done what you are supposed to do with you and yours, take you and yours to support others that need a father or a mother mentor. So what is the right tool for the right job? Manhood, womanhood. Specifically today, what is manhood? Manhood is rejecting passivity, accepting responsibility, leading courageously, and expecting the greater reward. Now, how on earth would I come up with something like that? And most of you, if you've been here any length of time, you've heard a similar approach to this message, and that is this, that uh, when I was supporting my brother before he died at Barnes uh, Liver Hospital, basically, that's where I was introduced to Robert Lewis and uh, Raising a Modern Day Night, which is where this definition comes from. Robert Lewis pastors a church of 7,000 in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's my understanding that they have, well, I don't know how many churches they have birthed, but uh, basically, when they reach that 7,000 mark, they send 2,000 out and start another church type thing. Or they'll send 200 out at a time, or they'll send 1,000 out at a time, and they'll start a church in another spot of Arkansas or, or Little Rock. Folks, that's a healthy church. That's a healthy church. God is, God is absolutely blessing. You know why? Because the pastor of that church is pushing authentic biblical manhood and womanhood, and they are modeling it, and God is blessing it. And in that book, he shares his own story, four boys, him and three other brothers, and his dad was an absentee dad. He's got a picture where his dad is standing in the shadows of a tree with the four boys, and he basically has separated the dad. It was supposed to be a father-son picture, and the dad has separated himself in the shadows, and he said that picture aptly describes my dad's role in my life. He just basically, he embraced passivity. He rejected responsibility. He did not lead at all, and he, couldn't, he didn't have anything to look forward to on how he exhibited his manhood. You see, the first Adam did that, and that is what this definition is based on. The first Adam came into this world, and he completely embraced passivity. Eve took of the apple, but Adam was the one that was given the command, do not eat. He rejected responsibility. Instead of saying, babe, please, please don't do that. G give that to me. Uh, let's put that back or, or whatever. Instead of that, he rejected responsibility. He did not lead. His sons were fatherless, if you will. Cain killed Abel. And he certainly didn't have anything to look forward to as a result of his manhood. Jesus was the second Adam or the last Adam. Jesus came in to the world, and what did he do? He rejected passivity. When the devil said, you just relax and let me take care of this, Jesus said, no, it is written. And he rebuked the devil at every spot. He rejected passivity. He accepted responsibility. Lord, if this cup could pass before me, but not my will, but thine be done. Aren't you so thankful for that prayer, church? What if he hadn't crawled up on that cross? What if he had not taken yours and my sin? What if he would have done what the first Adam, we, you and I would be lost still to this day in need of a Savior? But he accepted responsibility. He led courageously. He walked on the water and showed his disciples how to. He led courageously, and Jesus is absolutely expecting the greater reward. He's sitting on the right-hand throne of God right now, interceding for you and I, the Holy Spirit, making groanings that we don't even understand. We have a team 
on our side that is unbeatable. You know, you see all these lawyer firms, you know, they're so and so. We got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And they've all reached senior level partnership, every one of them. And they're on our team. And so, this is the tool real manhood, real womanhood. I want to challenge our men today. And believe it or not, this simple sermon's almost done. I want to lovingly challenge you from the first point of the message last week. Eden again. Fellowship. Men, this is the key. I could not be more proud of this church, of all the men that are in her. I mean, it's just unbelievable how many men faithfully attend this church. And you bring your family. Hallelujah. Praise the Lamb. You're leading them. I cannot say thank you enough. And I I dare say you are doing exactly what I'm asking you to do. Again, praise the Lord. If there's any room for improvement, this is what I would tell you. Practice in your fellowship. The first part of your day. Being in love with Jesus. Figure out what that means if if you don't know what it means. If you do know what it means, push the gas pedal down. You two being in love with each other. Being on the same page. You know what he wants out of you. He knows what you're going to do. Being on the same page. Totally devoted to one another. You're going to show up every morning. Every time that you've set aside, you're going to show up. And then as a result of this deep fellowship, church, and men, this will lead you to mirror this closeness in all of your relationships. Think about it. Husbands and wives being totally in love with each other. Fathers and sons, fathers and daughters, moms and sons, moms and daughters being totally in love with each other. Here we go. You ready? Being on the same page. Being on the same page, you know what so-and-so's going for, and they know what you're going for, and you're supporting each other. Being on the same page, totally devoted. You don't worry about them taking care of you. You know that you can trust them. And as a result, a deep fellowship. I told you all last week, and for our Sunday night crowd, I lovingly challenged them to take a 30-day challenge. Church, I'm I'm challenging you to take a 30-day challenge. Eden, again, it starts with fellowship. I had a great Monday. I did. I had a great Tuesday. Going to the dog retreat on Tuesday evening. Two ways you can tell when I'm in a vehicle if I'm right with God. I'm driving below the speed limit. I'm driving below the speed limit, and I've got 99.1 or its equivalent. In Arkansas, it's called K-Love. And I took that turn off of 63 at West Plain to go toward Norfolk Lake. So the, the moon, which looked to be about eight times its normal size, was on my left. And the only way I could take in all of those scenes was to drive even slower. You know, those roads are like around here. So I was going about 45 miles an hour. And I made this one turn. And this valley opened up, and there were three dead trees. The moon was cased right on top of them. I had to turn around. I turned around. I'm sure the guy that topped the hill just as I turned around probably thought I was a creeper because he slowed down real slow, probably knew the people's, you know, place that I was turning around in. And so I, you know, I just let him do his thing. He finally went on. But I turned around and I got, I stopped and I took a couple pictures. Because I, I needed to soak that in. And there was, I can't remember now, but there was a song going that just, it was amazing. It, it was one of those, and, and I remember what I've been trying to slow down. To see those moments of magnificence. To see God's magnificence and to respond with an adoring heart. And I'll show you the 
The phone on the picture, you know, if I was really good, I'd have sent it to Brad, but y'all know better than that. And it was amazing. Wednesday, the week got a hold of me, and I did not set aside that time. Thursday, I did not set aside that time. And then Thursday evening, it was like, man, it was going so great. And I had already started seeing the effects. So Friday, I, I reinstated. Saturday, I, I stayed true. This morning, first thing. Church, every one of us struggle. Can I get a witness? Here we go. You ready? Life is a series of new beginnings. Every time you mess up, start over. Start over. Start over. So, men, please, fellowship. Here's what it will lead to. And this is when you will know that you are in deep fellowship with whoever it is. Hopefully, it will start with the Lord. Guttural honesty. You know what I love about God? I don't got to put on any errors. I don't got to fake nothing. He knows. Guttural honesty. Your relationships with each other will improve if you'll get to that too. Guttural honesty. Total buy-in. Give him time. Loyalty. Loyalty that they can write books about. So here's our loving challenge to our men. You, I've already talked to you about the book. If you've got a young man, son, grandson, stepson, I mean, fill in the blank. You've got a man on your uh, neighborhood block that, that ha has taken you in uh, as a mentor. Maybe you didn't even sign up for it, but it's obvious he's looking to you for help to be a man and to such. I'm lovingly challenge you, challenging you this year by the book. Come and ask me. I'll get you a book. Whatever the case may be, get the book. Pick your community of men to help you train that young man into manhood. Set a date for your child. Hold a ceremony. Live this definition in front of your young man. I've already told you that Gavin and I will help you on any level that you need or want with this. And I thank you, Brother Gavin. This is what I shared with the young men that I had the opportunity at our Raising a Modern Day Night Man talk. A real man rejects passivity. I shared the, the definition. And then I shared this. God will lead you, but you must follow the prompting. You must follow the prompting. Now, this goes from man, woman, boy, or girl. If you're going to grow in your relationship with Christ, you must follow the prompting. So John Smith was one of my first promptings out of college. John Smith was the pastor of this church. John Smith was a soul winner. I don't know that I could have said that I, quote, unquote, led anyone to Christ before the Lord brought John Smith into my life. As a result of John Smith tutoring me in this area, I, I do it with abandon. I don't do it as often as I probably should have. I, I'm not anywhere as successful as I think I probably should. I'm telling you, I'm ready for it. If you come to me today and say, I need to know how to go to heaven, we're sitting down and I'm going to share with you. that God did that through John Smith. He'll do the same with you. Larry Sykes, experiencing God. I am indebted to Brother Larry. For one, uh, it'll come to me, Henry Blackaby is one of the greatest speakers of our day, not because he's a great speaker. He's a terrible speaker. He is. He's not going to hold your attention. You're going to have to give it to him. But what he has to say is life-changing. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. And you know what else he taught me? It's given me great hope. You have a responsibility, not just the speaker. I have a responsibility to be prepared and do my best to present it in a way that you will receive it. But you, it's called the discipline of the hearer. That's why I started saying boring things matter. Because Henry Blackaby is like, watching is like watching paint dry. Bless his heart. They, they, they didn't have a class for that in the seminary he went to. But oh my goodness. If you get over that, and I'm just going to say it, once I got over my immaturity, I grew because I listened. And church, one of the fixes for the discipline of the hearer is to come hungry. And one of the ways to come hungry is live for the Lord Monday through Saturday. <laughs> oh my, as you exercise and work for the Lord, you're going to come Sunday hungry. You're going to need and want this person to feed you. Keith Ragsdale, in his presence, 
Keith Ragsdale took me through that study on prayer, changed my life. Jerry Jolly, discipline in preaching. Tony, my brother, raising a modern day knight, spirit filled living. Bill Gothard, instant obedience to the initial promptings of the Holy Spirit. I, and this is what I told him. I have been given the building blocks of how to live out the definition of manhood by following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And then I told them, you will too. Church, if you follow, because I know God, he's working in your heart and soul right now to prepare you for what he wants you to do. If you will obey that, remember, obedience is the detail of love. If you obey what God is doing in your life, he will change you to look like him. And it will be the right tool for the right job. Let's all stand, musicians, will you come? Every head bowed, every eye closed. You just never know what someone is struggling with and hurting with. In a few moments after our invitation, we're going to pray for Melody as she starts her uh, mission trip. And then we're going to pray over Zach and Emmy. This is Zach's last Sunday with us, is my understanding. And then we're going to pray over them just for their a forthcoming wedding and the such. But you're here today and, and you've got a heavy load. I'm just asking folks, you, you may be here and you think, yep, things pretty good for me. The Lord's blessing me here, the Lord's blessing me there, whatever the case may be. Hallelujah, we praise God for that. But I'd ask you to consider yourself a prayer warrior today for those that are carrying a heavy load. God knows who they are, what they are, meaning what they're carrying. Lord, we ask you to do your will and way in this service today. I pray that we won't just sit through, stand through an invitation, but I pray that we will truly respond to the invitation. What, what have you put on our heart? What have you challenged us to do? What has rang our bell? Help us to respond to it. And I ask you to be with those that are carrying a heavy load pray that you'll take that load and you'll put it at the foot of your cross and you'll give them, as Brother Keith sang, grace for the trials, peace in the strife. I just love that line. And Lord, ultimately, I pray that they'll look to you for the strength and comfort that only you can give. If there's someone here today that does not know you in the free pardon of sin, we beg and pray that they'll be saved. It's everlasting too late. I pray for our fathers. Help us to be the right tool for the right job. I pray for our mothers. Help us to be the right tool for the right job. For our children to follow the biblical mandates for manhood and womanhood. In Jesus' precious and holy name we ask it. Amen.